You're very welcome to this exciting talk about Michael Collins. Was he a Democrat or was he a dictator? And we're going to be looking at this uh, topic with historian Joe Connell and Vic Gawker. We have uh, also given talks um, in the cobblestones to do Michael Collins' life in the War of Independence before. And also, we've collaborated on a number of films with Michael Collins' family, including some of the people who are here. And to do with the story of Michael Collins, and we're looking at it nearly every year to really get in depth with him. And um, so this talk centres on Michael Collins' later years, and it includes the challenges of the truce and the treaty, and it will look objectively at the divisive character of Michael Collins after the treaty was signed. And um, we're in a very historic building. Okay, and sometimes you need to take note of maybe even the buildings that we're in. And I think Joe Collins Booth is such a great, great resource in terms of finding our history about the buildings. The buildings are as important sometimes as the people because they give it character, even to let the city breathe. But not only are we in an historic building, we have got an historic audience. That's you guys. Okay, and we have families of Michael Collins, Eamon Roy, Harry Boland, Eamon Bolfin, everybody, great friends, great historians, okay? You're all very, very welcome. And this is some of Joe's books that I just wanted to show you. And um, historian author Joe Connell is one of those book authors who doesn't just write books, he writes directories. Uh, I adore some of Joe's books. I've read even the references uh, back to front, okay, at this stage. His wealth of information, his ability to cut like a hot knife through butter and just get to the facts can obtain some fascinating historical nuggets that don't just make the streets of Dublin come to life, but also the buildings and the people. Okay, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the filmmaker Marcus Howard and I run the Easter Rising Stories History Film Series. It's quite popular. It's on YouTube so everybody can see it from all over the world. I am also though a firm believer that history should be told warts and all. And we're coming up to that period now where there's a more complicated narrative. And I'm of the opinion we shouldn't shy away from that. We should face it head on. I've covered films with Colin's family. I've also <coughs> covered films with De Valera's family. And I've looked at pro-treaty and anti-treaty and the agonies and legacies that the Civil War has brought on. If we can't face up to the War of Independence and the Civil War head on around the 100 anniversaries, then when can we? It stems from what happened in 1916. So we're going to get started now. Okay, and I just wanted to just to let you know, this is the mansion house that you see here. Okay, in July of 1921. And you can see a picture here of General Neville McCready being greeted by the Mayor Lawrence O'Neill. Okay, in terms of the truce negotiations. And if, I don't know if you notice this, but he's got a big bulge here in his coat. He's concealing a weapon into the truce negotiations right here. Okay. This is also the crowd outside the mansion house okay, that are waiting on the outcome of, of the truce negotiations. We just put hands together with Joe Connell, please. First of all, you're very, very welcome here. And thank you so much for uh, giving us this talk. And what I'd like to ask, maybe or to start off on, is um, what was seen as a more effective tool to get Ireland and Britain to the stage of truce? Um, violence or democratic means? Uh, my background, for those of you who don't know, I was in the army when I was younger and I spent most of my life as a lawyer. So I look at things from a legal and or a military point of view. The military often uses the term uh, force multiplier. Uh, let me give you an example. If, if the IRA during the War of Independence had been able to bring in the number of tons of machine guns that they wanted to, that would have been a force multiplier. I would use that term, force multiplier, almost analogously to answer your question, Marcus, in the sense that I think that violence did greatly increase the ability to get independence and to get the, the, the people, the parties, to the negotiating table. Uh, without that, I don't think it would have happened. I think when you take a look, at actually, from the period from the 1880s, uh, when uh, Home Rule was first proposed, it kind of would make fits and stops and starts and everything else until 1920 when it was, 1912 rather, when it was passed. But I don't think they would have gotten to the bargaining table, and I certainly don't think that they would have achieved what they did at the bargaining table in the truce of 1920, 21, and then 22 without violence. Okay. 
Well, like if we're looking at something like um, the treaty then negotiations, okay, why would somebody like Michael Collins be sent to London and why wouldn't De Valera go? Um, Michael Collins throughout his career, and particularly during the, the time of treaty negotiations, said that he was a soldier, he was not a politician. Now, those of you uh, who might have heard anything I've said before know that I disagree entirely with that. I don't think that Collins was either a soldier or a politician. I think that he was the, the administrator of extraordinary. I think that's where his talents lie. And I think the fact that the way he died at the uh, Bell and Block kind of indicates he wasn't a soldier. But he thought of himself as one. He really did. I think he went to the, the treaty negotiations because he was doing his duties. He was following the orders of his chief. He argued very long and very hard with De Valera not to go. He tried not to go. But when it all came down to it, he was going to be a soldier, he was going to follow his leader, and he was going to follow his, law, his orders. On, on the opposite side of that, De Valera, I think, ultimately realized it was a mistake for him not to have gone there. I think when you take a look at the time and, and the reasons for it, De Valera went over, of course, after the truce. We saw the slide in here of the people coming to negotiate the truce. And De Valera went over to, the, to London to negotiate after that. And he realized in the very, very beginning, from July of 1921, that there was not going to be a republic. That there were going to have to be things that were done that were not going to be the things which many people thought were going to be true. As a result of that, I think that De Valera started looking at compromise right from the very beginning. Um, I don't know where Marcus is going with these questions, so I'm not going to jump around and jump ahead. But the fact of the matter is, De Valera knew a lot uh, was not going to be forthcoming, and I think he felt that he needed to come back to Ireland because he needed to try and maintain contact, particular contact, with the people in his cabinet and with the IRA. Of those particularly being Cahal Brewer and Austin Stack. I think he felt he would be better here than he would be over there. In addition, remember, this is 1921, and the peace negotiations after the end of World War I were held in Paris, and I think he saw just how poorly uh, the results were with the American President Woodrow Wilson. Wilson did lose contact with the American public when he was over there, and of course, De Valera was in America in 1919 and 1920. So I think he thought he was not going to make the mistake of going away from his base. He was not going to make the mistake of going away from the people that he thought he was going to have to make convince, or he could go along with it. People have talked about the fact that he was going to go over ultimately, and he did kind of hint around with it. But De Valera was one who was very astute in terms of this language, and he would say a lot of the things which people would take one way, but he might have meant from another. I think he might have thought that he could, would have gone over later in the negotiations. He certainly had opportunities to do so. So I think that he simply did not want to be there, and he thought he would be doing better here in Ireland, particularly with the captain. In terms of treaty negotiations, uh, do you think that the Irish got all they could from the treaty? Um, I, I think what you have to look to is you have to look at the things in, in context, you have to look at them the whole, whole period of time. I just spoke about De Valera going over in July, and he did. The treaty negotiations didn't start until the 6th of October, until the 1st of October. And during that period between July, August, and September, there was a great deal of negotiation, really, in the correspondence between De Valera and Lloyd George. And that correspondence actually lays out the treaty. It lays it out, lays it out almost entirely. It lays it out very specifically. And for a man like De Valera, who was a semanticist, who looked at every word, who poured over every word, who took his time so much over every word, the correspondence itself really lays it out those of you who have read a little bit know that one of the phrases was, and I'll paraphrase here just a little bit, but it was, the, the, the Irish were going to come to London to negotiate to determine how the aspirations of the Irish people could be made to mesh with those nations that were known as the British Empire. The key word there is how. Today you're looking at Brexit. When you see the two people at Brexit come out to the podiums in front, and one of them says, we had open and frank discussions. That's a diplomatic term, frank. It tells everybody in the world, it tells the journalists, it tells the politicians, it tells the diplomats, we did not agree on a single thing. That's what that word means. The word how in the phrase that I just gave you before is specific. It says that we have determined what is to be done. Consider this example. If I say to any of you, Let's get together after the, the meeting and we'll determine how we are going to Croke Park this weekend 
to see the match. We have already decided to go. We're just talking about the transportation. But if I say to you, let's get together afterwards to determine whether we will go to Croke Park this weekend, now we're talking about are we going or are we not? The compromise was already made. There was no republic. There was going to be an association with the British Empire that was already made before the negotiations ever started. So did the Irish get all they could? Probably. Were they snookered a little bit? Yes. The biggest snooker I think came with Arthur Griffin and the, and the Boundary Commission. Remember, again, the Boundary Commission was one that Lloyd George came to him alone in November and said, remember, I am a minority prime minister. I'm a minority in the parliament. My party is a minority in the parliament. I am a minority in the cabinet. But the Conservative Party is having their meeting, and I have to go with them to something so that they'll continue to support me. Will you sign a boundary commission if we can get that in? And Arthur Griffin said yes. And Arthur Griffin kind of forgot about that, and it didn't come up until just the last couple of days of the negotiations. So was that how it happened? Yes. But why is it important today? Because the official name of the party then and today is the Conservative and Unionist Party. Lloyd George didn't have much leeway, and the unionist aspect of that party name, we often forget that it was important 100 years ago as it is today. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because my next question, Joe, is going to be Did the British uh, get what they wanted with the treaty, or did they give up too much for themselves politically? One of the biggest reasons I think it brought the British to the, to the bargaining table was international opinion. National opinion in Great Britain was very much against the war by this time. The people didn't like this. They deplored what the black and tans were doing, and the king hated what was being done in his name. So remember, again, Lloyd George lost his job in October of 1922, and he always blamed that on giving up too much to the Irish at the time. I think the British pretty much gave what they had to give. There was always going to be an association with the British Empire, as they called it, then it turns into the Commonwealth of Nations. When you have an association, you have a head of an association. In this case, it was the king. There was going to have to be some recognition of that. The Irish wanted to minimize that as much as possible. The British wanted to leave it there. I think both sides pretty much gave and got what was available to be had in those trade negotiations. Uh, one thing that I find that comes up an awful lot um, is about the North. And um, I think it's interesting to bring us back to the whole um, par Parliament, uh, Irish Parliament, in terms of what they're debating. Uh, was partition or the oath? more important in negotiations, and did this change in the treaty debates? Um, partition had been around actually since 1913. Remember you had the uh, Ulster Covenant in 1912. In 1913, uh, John Redmond went to north to Belfast and met with John Dillon, and they discussed the concept of partition. It had been around since 1913. It was in and out of discussions in, in, all the way through. It was pretty much accepted that there was going to be some kind of partition. They talked then about what's going to be all of the uh, uh, the, the historical aspect of Ulster was it going to be six counties, was it going to be nine counties? So the uh, partition was always there. Uh, when, when they got to the uh, boundary commission and the treaty negotiations, people think that that was done in the treaty and it was not. There was a government of Ireland that act, that bill, and then act which was passed at the end of 1921. I'm oh, sorry, 1920. So in December of 1920, there was partition in Ireland. The North had already been separated in that particular way. I think the British looked upon partition as one of their weak points in their negotiation, which is why Lord George was so strong to try and work for some kind of boundary commission or something. I think they looked upon that in, in the international opinion as being one of their weak points in the negotiations. But partition was there, and partition was a fact actually going into the treaty. Not for the first time, and certainly not for the last time, 
Uh, I think that the Irish leaders did not understand what was important to the Irish people. To the Irish people at this time, partition was extremely important. To the leaders, it was not. So I think there were 338 pages of the uh, minutes of the Doyle Treaty debates, and only on nine pages was the word partition even found. There were 181 pages of the private debates, and only on three page, pages was the word partition found. Of the signatories to the treaty, only Michael Collins even mentioned the word partition in, in those debates. So partition was not important at all to the leaders, although it certainly was to the people. They just didn't understand that. The oath, on the other hand, was extremely important to the leaders. That was the thing that the treaty debates, treaty debates were about. And I don't think they understood the oath at all either. Carter say hands up. Was there an oath of allegiance in the treaty? I, probably most of you put your hands up. There was never an oath of allegiance in the treaty. Never. There was not one. It was never even being debated. There was an oath that said that the individuals would place their allegiance to the Constitution of, of Ireland and the Free State of Ireland. And they will pay and they will pledge to be faithful to King George V and his heirs and signs. I talked before about the concept of frank discussions or the word how. It's extremely important to look at the language. Because allegiance means I will do what you tell me to do. It means I will follow you. Faithfulness does not. Diplomatically, faithfulness means that we are equal and that I may or I may not do as you ask. And Jarvis Sullivan, for example, during the treaty debates, in one of the very few times that there was any kind of um, relief in the treaty debates, indicated that, I will give you an example. When a man gets married, he promises to be faithful to his wife, but he pro does not promise to obey her. And there was a lot of laughter and people, and somebody just stood up and said, wait until you get married. The oath was that which was important in the treaty debates. The partition was not. Did Collins um, view the treaty as the end? Well, I'm not sure that Winston Churchill ever did very much to Ireland, but he was always good for a quote. Uh, Winston Churchill said that uh, this is not the uh, beginning of the end, it's the end of the beginning. Collins looked at the treaty as the beginning of the beginning, I think. The fact of the matter is, if you take a look at it, he spoke in public of it being a stepping stone, where he spoke in public of it being giving us the freedom to achieve freedom. In private, he always spoke of it as, I'm going to work the treaty. Those are two different concepts. And Collins was very clear to everyone with whom he spoke that the treaty was just the start. It was the end, if you will, of the armed conflict in the South, and I, thought he, I think he felt that was extremely important. But as far as the treaty itself was concerned, and how far it was going to go, you know, Collins intended to work it. The Collins knew that those things could be done, but they could not be done right then. So you have to have a starting point, and I think he always viewed the treaty as the starting point, and to go from there. Well, just to stay on the North, um, what was the situation uh, in the North, and how was Collins dealing with it? Then? Because it's, uh, it's an interesting one. Uh, that sometimes gets left out when people are looking at the full story of Collins. Well, I think people forget the whole story of 1917, early 18, 19, certainly to 1921. Uh, there was there was a very harsh war in the North at the same time, and I think we forget about that. We forget about we think about the Black and Tans here in the South. We think about the auxiliaries in the South. We forget entirely there was a huge war going on in the North. It was pretty pretty sectarian at the time. Uh, one of the individuals who was very much in the lead of that was Field Marshal um, Henry Wilson, who was taken on by the uh, North government to tell them what to do. And Wilson was, uh, he was born in Ireland, of course, but Wilson was the kind of person that uh, one really has to shake one's head when one looks back at one of the things he did. He recommended to the Southern Irish people that what they should do was they should take note of all what he called shit-makers in the, in the area, put their names on the door of a church, and when any kind of an outrage occurred, you pick five of them by the lot and shoot them. That was his answer to everything. And pretty much that's the way the North was run. It was very brutal in the North all the way through, and it was very difficult. As far as Collins was concerned, he was very concerned about the North all the way through, particularly in the period after the uh, uh, treaty was ratified in January 1922, and then until his death, Collins was up to his ears in conspiracies in the North. Collins was fighting in every way that could have been done. He was telling a great many people a lot of things. He would tell one person one thing, another person another thing. 
you know, I talked about the fact that his wife had carried a pocket notebook, and he probably had to use it just to keep track of what he told everybody, because he was telling everybody different things. In the North, he was involved, actually, in trading guns with the North. It's strange it might seem. He was asking the British to give him guns to the Free State Army, giving them to the people in the four courts so they could send them up north, and send their old weapons to the North so the British couldn't trace them. Uh, the British knew about this. They didn't know exactly that. They couldn't figure it out. But in, in, in May of 1922, the Collins asked for 10,000 uh, more rifles and hand grenades and mines. And they told him, no, we understand rifles are defensive weapons, but hand grenades and mines are pretty much offensive, and we know where those are going to go. So Collins was very involved in, in, in trying to keep the North around. He was very involved in kidnappings. He was involved in taking hostages. Um, he was involved in keeping the IRA the battalions and brigades in the North involved. He was trying everything he could to do that, and as I say, that was very much in uh, contrary to what was accepted by his cabinet members and, of course, the British. So, with that, then, do you think that maybe, maybe hypothetically, but would it be signs that if he had lived, that he would have continued to have that with the North? Oh, the weddings are so interesting in the pub, aren't they? <laughs> um, I, I'm not really sure where you want to go with that because. Uh, uh, the the uh, the cabinet, you know, Cosgrave and O'Higgins and uh, Ernest Black, who was from the north, and Hogan, that they wanted no part of this. That they, they thought this was wrong. Cosgrave, of course, was a, was an administrator. He was on the uh, Dublin Corporation uh, way back in 1905, so he was not particularly a, a military man either. But he was a very fine administrator. Their point at this time was to bring the Free State into existence and to get it operating as a, as a government entity. They were not particularly interested in continuing the war at, at, at this point. Uh, I think the Collins would have had great problems with his own cabinet had he, had he lived and had he continued down this road. Um, but also, uh, two days after his, uh, his burial, they told the North, don't look to us anymore. You're on your own. Don't, we're not going to go down that road. Um, you mentioned about Field Marshal Henry Wilson. Uh, I mean, interesting enough, he was assassinated. Could you maybe explain why? Uh, Henry Wilson, as I mentioned, was, was very harsh uh, on the Irish. He, of course, was the uh, head of the British forces at one point in the uh, First World War. Uh, uh, Henry Wilson's idea was um, to kill every fly with a hammer. That, that's just simply the way he, he lived. That was what his life was and the way it went. Henry Wilson was advisor to the North, and he was very much involved in the programs up there. People really blamed him for that. Collins disliked him greatly. Uh, Collins did have him on a, a kill list, if you will, uh, early in, in the period of time. There was some indication that Collins put him on a kill list again in the treaty negotiations, said if, if anything happens and the treaty doesn't go through, then, then we'll, we'll take out Henry Wilson. The question of how he was, he was killed has always been somewhat of a question. Not so much how he was killed, but who ordered him killed has always been a big question. He was, uh, of course, killed on the 22nd of, of June. Um, some of the books, conspiracy books, which I, I, I kind of shake my head sometimes, but one of the conspiracy books said that he was he was purposely killed. The British pulled off his, his bodyguard because they thought that if he was killed, there would be a better way to negotiate with Griffin and Collins on the Constitution. Um, that book does not indicate how that was going to happen since the Constitution was passed six days before he was killed. So the conspiracy theories here go in and out. Henry Wilson was, I say, on a list. The question is, did uh, two men, Dunn and O'Sullivan, kill him on their own? Was it ordered by Collins? Was it ordered by Sam McGuire? Those of you who don't know, yes, that's the very same Sam McGuire. Was it killed by uh, somebody else in, um, in the uh, forecourt, perhaps? Uh, Dunn was the head of the IRA in London during the War of Independence. He reported directly to Rory O'Connor, who was the head of the IRA in forecourts. Uh, Dunn had come over to uh, Dublin before that. This was a very strange kind of assassination. They, they waited until he came home from a, a ceremony, and then the two of them just ran up and shot him, and they tried to get away, which was going to be impossible, since uh, Joseph O'Sullivan had a wooden leg, and he couldn't exactly run very well. He had lost it. Both of them were uh, you know, veterans of the First World War. So uh, when we talk about who shot him, there was never any question about who shot him. They, they, they got away, they were captured very quickly, and, and then went from there. And again, conspiracy theories about was the Collins, uh, the British thought it was the Four Courts people. 
certain the fact that he was killed Leatherbridge to put great pressure on Collins to attack the four courts to get them out of there. I think it gave the Winston Churchill uh, a great opportunity to say, okay, that's it, that's enough. Start to get rid of those people in the four courts. There are a couple things here that I think you have to understand, Marcus. I'm going to shoot your head here for a second. Go first. If you take a look here, see where his hand is? His yeah. arm, yeah. body, body, and his arm. Yeah. There are books that talk about how he was killed, and there are books that talk about inquests. It wasn't necessary to determine how he was died. They knew who, even the people who did it. But there were two pathologists. One of whom said he was shot four times, and one of whom said he was shot eight times. When Rex Taylor wrote his book, Assassination, in 1960, he, he also pointed out that the chief pathologist in London at the trial said that Henry Wilson was shot six times. And Taylor said that somebody has to be lying. But many of the writers very quickly say somebody has to be lying about many things. And that's not true. A bullet going in there goes through this arm, here, comes through his body, here, here, here. Is that wound? Once, three, five. A pathologist can say one or the other. So the fact that you have three pathologists saying four, six, and eight wounds does not mean to me that anybody's doing perjury as a lawyer. Does not mean anybody's lying. It simply means there's a difference of interpretation. And Marcus indicated earlier we'll talk about Collins' death. Lots of differences of interpretation without necessarily good facts behind them. Okay. It's, it's interesting, but I mean, and it leads on to the next question as well. Um, it's often written in, or thought that the attack in the Four Courts came as a result of British pressure after the Wilson assassination. Well, what do you think is the complete story? Remember, people think that the British Army left uh, Ireland very quickly. Certainly, very many people did. Very many British did fairly quickly after the uh, truce, uh, or rather, the treaty was signed in January. But there were still uh, of the eleven thousand troops that were once in, in Dublin or right around the truce time. There's still about six thousand troops, British troops, in Dublin at the time. They were here, and, and many of the troops didn't leave Dublin until the end of December of 1922. So the British did order the General McCready that you saw earlier. They did order him to attack the four courts. McCready was was a very good military and political general. He didn't make too many mistakes, I don't think. He was one of the better generals I think the British had. And he just refused and said, no, let's slow down, let's stop. Had he done so, that would have been what exactly the four courts garrison wanted. They wanted to be fighting the British. They did not want in any way to fight the Irish either. But there's another thing that we talked earlier about, about the North. There was a great deal of communication between the North and between the four courts. One of the other things that people talk about in terms of that time was a raid on Ferguson's garage for some automobiles. What was the reason for that? Well, the commandant of that, of the anti-treaty forces, <clears throat> Excuse me, was Henderson was captured. The reason was to get transportation, take weapons and people to the north to attack. In uh, reaction to his capture, the Four Force people had captured J.J. Uh, O'Connell, who was one of the primary people uh, in terms of the army here in Dublin. Collins used the capture of O'Connell to attack the Four Courts. But the key is that fight in the north. On the 27th, the, the Four Courts was attacked on the 27th, on the 28th. On the 27th, the Four Courts garrison planned to attack in the north. The Collins knew about this. And he also knew that was loaded tree completely out of water. That could not happen. So I think in terms of this, he must look at it as, I have to go in there now, primarily, I have excuses, I have O'Connell, I have Wilson, I have this, but I have to stop this raid in the north. I think that was probably more important than actually than Wilson's death at the time. I think you have to take a look at, at things, a lot of things in combination, and it's not that one or the other is the absolute most important, but that they all are in combination, and, and that's they're there. If we take a look at both the Four Courts garrison and the Free State garrisons, a day or two before the attack, there was no indication this was going to happen. We often, often think about results, uh, looking at back at results indicating intentions, and that's just not true. The Four Courts garrison did not start to stockpile water, they did not start to stockpile food, they did not do the kinds of things that a military person would do if they, if they knew an attack was coming. On the Free State side, J.J. O'Connell was captured. Now, he was captured walking home alone after he took his girlfriend to the theater. That's not what you do if you find more the next day. 
More importantly, John McConnell was the commander at the time of the, of the army. He was in County Donegal on his name. He didn't even get called home <laughs> until after the four courts was attacked. So I don't think this was a long-term thing. I think it was a very quick, ad hoc decision that was necessitated by Wilson, by O'Connell, and by the attack of the North. Was a civil war inevitable? It's going to happen anyway. I knew it was going to happen anyway. Uh, even in December, before the, 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 the treaty was brought back, but before the debates, the murder of Connor and a great many others were talking about fighting. They were talking about saying just throwing the treaty out. Was a civil war as we know it now, as, as we know it nationwide, as we know it as, as violent as it was, with all the antipathy that remained for so many years, was that necessary? No. No, I do not think so. I think that, again, what we have is a compromise that everybody should have recognized. Remember, when, when Devil Eric came back from the Jewish negotiations with uh, Lloyd George in July, he went to the Doyle and he said, you must understand we are not doctrinaire Republicans. He told them. Collins, before he ever went over to London to negotiate the treaty in September, before he went over to London in October, went down to talk to the leaders of the IRA in court and said, we will not get a Republican. It's not even negotiating. We're not going down that road. How often do we have ourselves who hear but don't listen? When the treaty negotiations started, I think that, that it was clear that, that things were going to go this way, but I don't think people understood that. And so I think that it was inevitable there was going to be fighting. It was not inevitable there was going to be a civil war in the terms that we think of the civil war as it was. And I think there were many things, many facts that went into that to have exacerbated it, um, that, that caused the civil war to go along the lines it did. But it, it was good, there was going to be fighting, I think. One thing that I found that you said at a previous talk that really, really I found interesting uh, was that history was always in flux. And that brings me to the next question. Um, is there a more complex narrative than pro-treaty being seen as those were the Democrats and the anti-treaty being seen as dictators after the vote by the general public? Has there been a degree of revisionism, let's say, regarding how this is now seen? I think it's much more complex than that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that as individuals, we, are, we very often like black and white. We, we very often like things that are very clear to us. But life, everything is, is very complex. And, and, and there are a, a lot of indications at the time that people were acting in, in various ways. I, I think the idea of saying that the uh, anti-treaty forces were dictators and the pro-treaty forces uh, we're all Democrats is, is just, uh, that's incomprehensible to me. I don't understand that. I don't understand how we can look at that. They both were acting, in a sense, in, in dictatorial ways, and they both were acting, in a sense, in democratic ways. On the anti-treaty side, remember, they kept saying that the British uh, the British are here, the British have the armed forces, the British are telling us what to do, the British are telling their own forces to attack the four courts. Uh, the, the free state government is not acting freely, it's not acting democratically, it's acting as uh, as a result of the uh, pressure coming from the British government, and they are acting dictatorially. Uh, Harry Boland, for example, there, there was a projected meeting of the IRA in, in March of 1922, and Harry Boland said when that was prorogued by uh, Mulcahy and Collins that they're acting as dictators. For all the time, the anti-treaty forces thought that, that the um, uh, pro-treaty forces, the, the free state government, they were acting very dictatorially. It wasn't just one-sided. On the other hand, very many writers thereafter, later on in the, in the time of writing about it, said that, look, there was an election on the 16th of June, 1922, the people voted. The people voted not so much for the treaty, but the people voted for peace. They were tired of war. They wanted the war to end. You know, they, they didn't like partition, they didn't like the oath, but they wanted peace. The, the results of that, the, the, the Constitution was only published on the very morning of the election. They already made up their minds that they wanted peace at this time. So again, to take a look at that election itself, which was, in a sense, a dictatorial kind of thing, because Collins and De Valera agreed between the two of them, very much away from what the cabinet wanted, that we'll simply divide the, 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 uh, the, uh, the cabinet and go from there. That's a dictatorial decision. So I don't think that either side can be said to be 100% dictatorial, nor 100% democratic. Let me just go on because you asked the second question here, at least I think. And that's a, the, the, the historiography of, of 1970 and 1980, 90, uh, it was completely dictated to Democrats. 
if you look at the books that were written at that particular time, they were that way. I think there was a great deal of influence that comes from the North as a result of that, or that's the result of the influence from the North. At the time, if you take a look at this, they were, they were trying to say that this was a constitutional foundation of the Irish state. There was nothing to do with violence. There are books that say that the, the free state government was not, there's a book that I can think of right now, there's a book that said that the free state government did not have anything to do with extrajudicial killings. I don't know how that author explains those killings that happened on the 8th of December, 1922, when, when O'Connor and McKelvey and Barrett and Mellos were killed. So the fact of the matter is, if you take a look at this, there's an awful lot of books that are written from a particular, from a particular political, timely point of view. And I think that those are now shifting back because I think that political point of view was unwarranted and certainly was unnecessary to go to that degree to establish the constitutionality of the Irish government. That's an opinion. That's not a fact, that's an opinion. One thing that I just wanted to ask you just um, was uh, about Harry Boland. Um, what do you think about Car Colin's character in terms of Harry Boland's last days? Let me, let me just start with the movie Michael Collins here for one second to give it a bit, just a couple minutes of summation. I set up a lawyer for my life now. I practice in California. Uh, rarely, but a few times, I, I practice very much on the, on the very periphery of the entertainment industry. The first thing that anybody, the first thing Neil Jordan had to do was go into a, a, a studio, I think it was Warner Brothers, I, I think it was Warner's, but I'm not sure. And I think he had to go in there and he had to convince Warner that he was going to put people in the seats with this story. That's what one must do with every single movie when you're making the pitch to a studio. Now, Liam Neeson was a star at the time, he was, not, he was not nearly the star that he is now, but he was a star at the time, and that's going to bring people in. I hear one of the biggest complaints of all about Julie Roberts being in the movie. She didn't have a terrible Irish accent. Yeah, okay. And there were other Irish people that could have filled in that role and all those sorts of things. Julie Roberts was coming off of Pretty Women. Julia Roberts was a huge star. Julia Roberts brought more people to the theaters than did Liam Neeson. So when you look at the film, it is a what we call a, a docudrama. It's not a true story. It's not intended to be a true story. But it is a film, and you must look at it like that. As far as Harry Bowen is concerned, I think the way that he was portrayed in the film was probably fairly accurate most of the way through. But I think it's fairly accurate. He did have a, a tremendously close, intimate relationship with Collins. They, they were just absolutely the best of friends. Obviously, there was the, the threesome with uh, Kitty Carey. And anybody who's been involved in any kind of tricorder romance must look at this film and see all kinds of things there that they've seen in their own lives as well. And it's very hard, very harsh. Of course, Bowen went to the United States. He was there with Del Lair. He was there for about a year and a half. And when he came back, uh, Collins had uh, pretty much taken over that particular romance. I think then that the relationship had to suffer. But Bowen was a very intelligent individual. He was very much involved in the IRB, as was Collins. Uh, Bowen was instrumental in bringing Collins and De Valera together before the Collins and De Valera Pact. So Bowen, as Collins, was trying very, very hard to, some, to find some kind of accommodation for the, uh, the treaty and, and the ways to go. No one really wanted a civil war. Very few people wanted to fight at all. So I give Bowen a great deal of credit at times for coming back and, and trying maybe a man whose heart was broken, even, and trying to deal with this other person who was on the other side romantically and politically and dealing, trying to bring about some kind of resolution which would be for, in favor of the Irish nation. Um, could Collins be considered a dictator uh, based on his actions after the treaty from January 1922 on? Sometimes I greatly question Marcus's intent when he has me up here, and I think that this, uh, I think that one is a chance to see if Ireland still believes in hanging, drawing, and quartering. For me to answer a question of that type. Um, the, word, the word dictator, I think, is, is very emotive. Uh, we think in terms of that being synonymous with um, tyrant, you know, a, a, a Joseph Stalin. No, that was not cause. So let's remove that. Uh, uh, in, in his book, uh, in 1999, Independent Ireland, Michael Laffin wrote that the Free State Government was autocratic, 
If you have an autocratic government, you probably have an autocrat. That's not quite as offensive a term, maybe. Uh, the word dictator actually comes from the Roman times when the uh, Senate would appoint a person, a dictator, to manage the country in times of crisis. That's not a bad definition for what Collins was. Between the 7th of January 1922 and his death and in August of 1922, uh, Collins was the head of the provisional government that reached until the 12th of July. Collins prorogued the, the uh, ability of any kind of parliament to go any kind of constituent assembly five times before he died. Uh, he said, no, uh, we'll do this when the war is over. No, we'll do this later. No, we'll keep going. The Labor Party at the 1st of August said, if you don't have one of these soon, we're going to withdraw our, our support for the provisional government. And even on the 21st of August, the day before he died, he wrote back and said, no, we'll do this when the war is over. So was he acting as a dictator in that way? Well, he was certainly acting as, as, as an individual who had absolute control. Because he did. On the 12th of July, he resigned his position. He said that he was no longer, he was, uh, no longer going to continue his ministerial functions, as he phrased it. And he appointed himself the commander-in-chief. And then two days later, he wrote to Arthur Griffin and said, you know, it's probably a good idea if you confirm that appointment. He did it himself. And if you look at the correspondence between that time with Cosgrave and the he would say, I suggest that we do this. And those suggestions were invariably taken. The Cosgrave government, on the other hand, would say, we think that this is what should be done, comma, with, a, with the approval of the Commander-in-Chief. So he had not absented himself from the civilian government at all. They were doing what he wanted. There were very few little appointments of individuals or something, but all of the major appointments and or the major policies were done with the approval of the Commander-in-Chief. So if one wants to take a look, and if one wants to take a look at one's definitions, I do believe that he acted with absolute control and without any kind of the government being controlled over him, that a constituency, an assembly, uh, a uh, cabinet would do. Does that make him a dictator? You're the jury. Well, I just want to say, um, myself and Joe have done a number of interviews, and I really think that Ireland and Dublin and people who are interested in history, book authors, or well, the graduates, some of the research that you've done. Joe, thank you very much.